The Witchcraft of Salem Village by Shirley Jackson is a historical account of the infamous Salem Witch Trials that occurred in 1692 in the Puritan community of Salem Village, now Danvers, Massachusetts. Jackson explores the social, religious, and psychological underpinnings that led to this notorious period of American history, where paranoia, fear, and superstition resulted in the execution of 20 people and the imprisonment of many others on charges of witchcraft. The book begins by setting the scene in Salem Village, portraying it as a tense and isolated community characterized by strict Puritan beliefs and a strong sense of the supernatural. Salem's inhabitants were deeply religious and believed that the devil was constantly trying to infiltrate and corrupt their community. The initial accusations of witchcraft were made by young girls who claimed to be possessed by the devil and tormented by witches. These girls, including Betty Paris, her cousin Abigail Williams, and their friends, exhibited strange behaviors such as inexplicable fits, contortions, and outbursts. The first women accused of witchcraft were Sarah Good. Sarah Osborne, and Tituba, an enslaved woman who worked for Reverend Samuel Paris, Betty's father. These three women were easy targets for the accusations. Good was a homeless beggar, Osborne had a reputation for not attending church, and was in a legal dispute with the Putnam family, and Tituba was an outsider due to her ethnicity and status as a slave. As the frenzy escalated, more individuals were accused including respected members of the community, such as Rebecca Nurse and Martha Corey. The central figures driving the witchcraft accusations were Thomas Putnam and his daughter Ann Putnam, Jr. The Putnams were involved in various land disputes and personal feuds with some of the accused witches, which likely influenced the accusations. The court, presided over by judges such as John Hathorne and Jonathan Corwin, relied heavily on spectral evidence, testimony based on dreams and visions, which was considered valid at the time. The accused were subjected to humiliating and invasive searches for witches' marks and faced fraudulent trials where they were presumed guilty until proven innocent. Several of the accused witches, including Bridget Bishop and Giles Corey, refused to confess to witchcraft. Bishop was the first to be hanged while Corey was subjected to a brutal execution known as pressing, where heavy stones were placed on his chest until he died. Others like Tituba and Mary Bradbury confessed to witchcraft in an attempt to save themselves from execution. The witch trials reached their peak with the hanging of the last group of accused witches, which included Martha Corey, Mary Eastie, and others. Throughout the trials, the influential and wealthy were largely spared, while the marginalized and powerless bore the brunt of the accusations. The judicial system in Salem was marked by a lack of legal representation for the accused, the use of leading questions, and the acceptance of flimsy evidence. Jackson highlights the role of Reverend Cotton Mather, a prominent minister who initially supported the trials and the use of spectral evidence. However, public opinion slowly began to turn, and by the end of the trials, skepticism had grown. This led to growing criticism of the proceedings and eventually the use of spectral evidence was forbidden. The colony's governor, William Phipps, dissolved the court, and the remaining accused witches were released from prison. The aftermath of the Salem witch trials saw the community grappling with its collective guilt and the erroneous judgments that were made. Many of the jurors and judges publicly confessed their errors and sorrow for their actions. In 1711, the Massachusetts government passed a bill clearing the names of some of the executed individuals and providing financial restitution to their families. Jackson also touches on the psychological aspects of the trials, suggesting that the girls' behaviors could have been the result of societal pressures and the afflicted individuals could have unknowingly been involved in a kind of mass hysteria. She goes on to explore the social dynamics that could have contributed to the witchcraft accusations, including jealousy, feuds, and the tense atmosphere of Salem Village itself. At the epicenter of the witch trials was the worldview of the Puritans, who believed in the absolute good of the church and the explicit evil in the world. This duality permeated their interpretation of events, and anything unexplainable or unfortunate was often attributed to the devil's influence. The book concludes by considering the long-term impact of the Salem witch trials on American society. 
The trials became a dark symbol of the dangers of extremism, false accusations, and the breakdown of community harmony caused by fear and suspicion. Jackson's account is both a historical narrative and a cautionary tale, reminding readers of the importance of reason, the protection of the innocent, and the pursuit of just laws. In The Witchcraft of Salem Village, Shirley Jackson presents a vivid portrayal of a time rife with panic and injustice that holds enduring lessons for society. The events of 1691 to 1692 in Salem serve as a lens through which to examine the complexities of human behavior and the potential for mass hysteria to take root and cause widespread harm within a community. Through meticulous research and engaging storytelling, Jackson invites readers to delve into the paranoia and tragedy of the Salem witch trials, ensuring that the cautionary tales of this historical episode are not forgotten. You can listen to the full audiobook for free by following the URL in the description.